Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. I'm Chip Patterson. Come to you live at youtube.com slash cover3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thanks for joining it. Thanks for hanging out. This is a mailbag episode, and we are not limited to the questions that we've already flagged from the big old bag of mail. If you want to have some listener participation, jump on in the chat, smash the subscribe, smash the like, come and join the conversation. We are always willing to jump on a tangent, especially in these shows that are dedicated to you. The questions that you will hear a little bit later on, questions on LSU in 2022, an interesting proposal for the college football playoff from the rankings perspective, another one uh, with our, our beloved soccer influence and it's it's Tom and Chip. We will not shy away from talking about weather. So yes, when a when someone gives us that five star review and they put their question in that review, we are going to throw it in the big old bag of mail. We will tackle it in a future mailbag episode. But before we get to some of those questions, uh, let's get into some of the news of the week. Uh, first, a little bit of housekeeping. Tom, are you ready? Tomorrow, first locks episode of the season, week zero locks. Is your board ready? Yes. I'm a little nervous, though, honestly. It's like the week zero and week one jitters, typically, because we know so little about these teams at this point. And I always worry, like, in this competition in which so much is on the line, if you get off to a slow start, you got to spend the rest of your year digging yourself out. These are these are crucial weeks, because like a good start, even when you don't know anything, can kind of just lift your confidence for an entire season. You mean like Illinois in, two, in 2021? <laughs> Yes, but I also just mean my picks record against the spread. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you come out here, and um, <laughs> I, I was doing, I was doing some reviewing of uh, last year's episodes for a project, which the listeners will get to hear soon. But like last year during week zero, Bud dropped a UCLA first half team total, UCLA first half uh, against the spread, UCLA full game, just like. I think he was like six or seven plays deep and only hit about three games. You can get sicko and fill out a full like 10, 11 play board, even though we're only looking at about seven games here in week zero. Yeah, I, I fear for what Bud's going to do tomorrow. There's probably going to be 20 locks on what, 10 games? <laughs> he's going to have he's going to have first quarter overs, second quarter unders. He's going like, to he's going to go nuts. Yeah, so again, uh that is coming tomorrow, Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern time if you want to join us live the week zero locks. It begins our season long habits and routines of joining you every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time to be able to roll out our locks for the week. That news of this week, I, I begin with a headline and I need to to ask you, obvious, is this news, Tom Fernelli? Nick uh, Saban, this is a game show we could play. Is this Nick, news? Is this news? Nick Saban has received a raise and a contract extension at Alabama. The new contract is now going to have him running all the way until 2030. It also includes a raise, which, interestingly enough, was triggered because of losing the national championship game, sort of. He will be paid an average annual value of $11.7 million a year, which puts him just ahead of Georgia coach Kirby Smart, who signed a new deal earlier this offseason that's going to pay $11.2 million over 10 years. Tom Fernelli, is this news? Uh, Nick Saban getting a contract extension and a raise is not news. What is news is that he's going to coach through the entire thing. He announced that, yes, no. Um, Yeah, it's news because... It's Nick Saban. It is an extension, which is ridiculously long because there is no way he's going to be. If he's coaching at the end of this extension, I don't know what I will do, but I will be very surprised and I will owe somebody money for it. Um, but it's just it's kind of, you know, in line with what he's done as the coach. But when you see some of the money that was handed out this offseason to some other coaches who I think are good coaches, but very few coaches are even coming close to being as accomplished as Nick Saban. You kind of have to balance that scale out a little bit. Like he deserves to be paid more if that's what the market price is. And he has all the leverage in the world to ask and go get that raise. So, yeah, it's news in that it's something for us to talk about, but it doesn't really mean anything because Nick Saban will be at Alabama for as long as he wants to be at Alabama. It is. We always talk about Mark Stoops as having one of the best contracts in college sports where um, reaching the seven win plateau automatically throws an extra year and a raise onto your contract, reaching 10 wins, something that Stoops has done a couple of times, adds two years to the deal. But this this is probably one of my my favorites because Nick Saban's uh, contract says that 
the total, if Nick Saban's total guaranteed compensation is less than the average of the top three highest paid coaches in the SEC or less than the average of the top five highest paid coaches nationally, the university agrees to pay Saban the higher of the two averages. Um, the, save, the contract, actually, the language says, that you can revisit this annually in terms of, quote, marketplace trends regarding head football coach compensation, which means that Nick Saban went to Alabama a while back, or Jimmy Sexton, and said, all right, here's the deal. Whatever the highest paid coaches are, I want that. Mm -hmm. And I want more than that. Mm -hmm. So as Kirby Smart gets a massive new deal to become the highest paid coach in college football, it then automatically triggers Alabama revisiting the entire contract so that you can then add an extension and a raise. And as Will says in the chat, it is 3D chess, losing to your former employees so that you can make more money than him. Yep. Truly amazing stuff. I, I, It's one of my favorite wrinkles in all of this. is Because, again, fair, right? Who else in college football that is an active coach right now has the resume of Nick Saban? Nobody. We talk about him like the greatest coach of all time. He is undoubtedly the greatest coach active right now. He deserves to be the highest paid coach in college football. And these kind of uh, triggers and clauses, I do think, keep Nick Saban from ever having to feel like he's going back to the table. Like it's it's very much a you guys figure it out thing. All right, top three in the SEC or top five nationally. You know, the average of that, I want more than that. Like, that's a, a very nice way of like, here's a formula I agree to, and I don't want to have to come back to this table again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I, if you have it, if you have the ability to put that in your contract, put that in your contract. Also, I want to shout out Darren Ravel, who tweeted yesterday after the extension was announced that per day during the football season, Saban will make more than the average Alabama tuition which is an excellent reminder that college football coaches are probably paid too much and that college costs way too much. So it does cost way too much. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Um, shout out to public education. So mm -hmm. I got through that. Um, next part of this, before we move on from Nick Saban, we've got a couple of starting quarterbacks that were announced recently that I want to hit on. You mentioned he's not going through 2030. So let's, let's go total like barroom conversation here. What's your over under on when, how much longer Nick Saban is the head coach at Alabama? Well, Bud's not here, but Bud's convinced he's retiring after this year, isn't he? Isn't that what Bud was saying last year? He yes. thinks he's got one more. Yeah. So I would probably go higher than that. I think two and a half years, probably. I, I mean, there it hasn't been a drop off. And I feel like as long as he's healthy and there's no obvious decline on the field, he's probably going to keep going until, because I mean, he's what, 73? I mean, what else is he going to do at this point? Like he, he's he clearly he could have retired a long time ago if he wanted to and been living pretty, pretty comfortably traveling the world, doing whatever the hell he wanted to in his retirement, if that's what he wanted to do. Clearly, what he wants to do is run Alabama's football program. So I think he's going to be there at least I would say two and a half is where I'd set it. I'd probably go over, but. I don't know. I also think there was a comment, too, that said that this extension helps with Alabama's recruiting. Sure. Like, do you really think this is the one That's thing it. that would? Yeah. Like some kids going to be like, well, I really like a lot of what Alabama has to offer, but Saban's contract only runs through 2027. I'm not sure if this is for me. Yeah. Um, he's turning 71 uh, this October, and I think it will be longer because of the transfer portal. And here's what I mean by that. Nick Saban at so many different points in the last 10 to 12 years has talked about something that he was uh, opposed to in college football that was looked at as an innovation or, or progress or moving forward. He said he didn't like it. And then he mastered it. Mm -hmm. He hurry up offense. He was like, I, I don't, we, we don't want to do this. Is it, he, the quote, is this what we want football to be? He got forced through. Everybody was so excited. This was going to be the way that you beat Alabama, this hurry up offense. Then he went and mastered the daggum hurry up offense, run pass option. The RPOs is, I don't know if we want this, you know, we pr might prefer the NFL style. So then he got forced through no changes have been made. So now Alabama starting with Tua and now definitely with Bryce young tears up defenses with a bunch of RPOs, uh, the transfer portal and freedom of movement. You know, he, he wasn't ever like totally against it, 
but he never seemed to be fully in favor of this. So mm. now what does he do? It's been put in place. He goes and he takes the best wide receiver from his conference rival and one of the best running backs in the country to be able to fill the needs on his roster. Name, image, and likeness. He might have been pointing to Texas A&M this past offseason, but you can bet that they are going to have that machine up and running and improved in a way that they're going to continue to get top one through three classes. All these times we've looked at these innovations and been like, this is how you close the gap with Alabama. And at every time I think Nick Saban gets new life, he is reinvigorated. He continues to extend what I believe is going to be uh, his legendary career. So as long as the whatever downfalls or mistakes he makes in recruiting, he can address through the transfer portal, like, I don't know, Jaleel Hall, Jaleel Billingsley, Jai Hall, like, I don't know, any number of the Alabama players that have been transferring out of the program. Like, if you can just replace them, not with freshmen, but even with experienced players from the transfer portal, then yeah, he can keep this thing going and have a national championship contender for as long as Miss Terry will allow him to keep going to the facility uh, as often as he wants to go to the facility. He built out the staff of analysts before anybody else. He set the trend there. Like at every point in this, Nick Saban has, ex in my opinion, has extended his career because he has mastered these aspects of innovation that everyone thought would allow everyone to play keep up. Yeah, he's got that growth mindset. That's like he finds new things to learn and get better at. And that's how even after dominating the sport for as long as he has, he still finds ways to challenge himself and figure things out and see if he could still continue to dominate the sport. And he has, which granted, it's much easier to continue dominating the sport once you already are. But still, a lot of coaches have gotten to not the mountaintop, but have had success and then been able to un not sustain that because they've just kind of kept doing what they've been doing. Nick has not done that. He's changed up when he's had to, and it has helped him be up there as long as he has been. Um, growth mindset. Wasn't that a like cover three book club reference from a while ago? Uh, yeah. It's also, it's a thing, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a it's Ted talky kind of thing, but it's a thing, but it's a thing. It, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it matters. It's, it's like, uh, our friend Martin Rickman and I always said that th there's something about listening to all the coach speak all the time that might be good for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Motivational as, che as cheesy as the cliches are, they are, uh, you know, there's, there's some truth to them. All right. Uh, on to continuing the starting quarterback announcements first let's go out to Washington where Michael Penix has been named the starting quarterback for the Huskies he transferred into the program and he entered a room with a couple of talented and capable options even if the offense last year certainly was woeful some of that uh, I think that we've got to look at Kalen DeBoer coming and taking over and the relationship that he had there yet another example of a transfer quarterback and either a head coach or a coordinator being able to renew a previous relationship was uh was Penix always the starter in your mind in that Washington room and what are your expectations for that Huskies offense with him at the helm I I didn't have him like penned in as a starter as a certain starter but I thought he was probably your most likely option simply because he's transferring in despite the fact that you know they have dylan morris they have sam heward coming in on the depth chart who were highly rated guys coming out of high school who you know clearly they don't feel you know it's kaylin DeBoer's coming in maybe he just didn't have enough confidence in them to just stick with them as is no doubt it's going to be one of these two guys he wanted to bring in some kind of veteran you know presence somebody who's been in this stuff before and Penix was the guy i think as far as what he brings to washington Headaches. He's going to bring headaches. <laughs> I think turnovers. Me, yeah. I think Michael Penix is a very talented player. I just also think that Michael Penix is one of those players who sometimes understands that he's talented and doesn't realize that he's also capable of making mistakes. And maybe he shouldn't be trying that throw just because he knows he can make it doesn't mean that you should try to make it. And I think that gets him into trouble. But then again, I mean, he's kind of like a Bo Nix. And that's one of the funny things. Like you look at the Pac 12 with Oregon. They actually have Bo Nix, and now Washington has their version of Bo Nix, in which there are going to be moments of brilliance that help get you through the moments of what the hell are you doing that for? So it's going to be up and down. It's going to be roller coaster. -y. I'm not shocked that he is going to start the season as quarterback. I will also not be shocked if Morris or Heward take over that job as the season goes along. Also health, right? I mean, yeah. we've got to look at Michael Penix based on his own personal history, based on um, – Playing style, you know, the things that make him great, the things that make him dynamic also open him up to uh, potential injury moving forward. And, and just with the, the way that his career has gone, 
if I am Hewitt or Morris, stay ready because you might have to be getting in there and getting going. Now, also, this announcement came down just before we started taping. Pitt has announced that Keaton Slovis has won the job. Uh, I'll go ahead and get things started, and I'm saying that's that's a good thing because I looked at I looked at Nick Patty as like if Slovis can't get everything together, then at least we know we've got someone that we trust, who's confident, who's Kenny Pickett's backup for a couple of years, and then that's probably where the pit offense would, um, you know, bend a little bit more towards a reversal of a ground and pound, run the ball more. Pat Narduzzi has said he wants to run the ball more this year, but with Keaton Slovis, at least we've got a, ver a little bit more of a vertical passing option. They both get, I mean, they're both capable passers, but Slovis at his best at USC is going to be able to create results that are going to take advantage of moving the ball down the field through the air. I think a little bit better than if he had not been able to win the job. Yeah. But I also, I I'm not hundred percent sure what Keenan Slovis we're going to get because when he first burst onto the scene at USC and kind of just, you know, after JT Daniels got hurt, Slovis steps in pretty much takes the starting job away from him because he played so well. But then we saw he had a shoulder injury in his second year and there was not nearly as much life on the ball as there had been in the first season. And that's really kind of been the case since where he can push the ball vertically. He's just not doing it as well as he had been originally. And I don't know, like, I, I don't think that's going to be that huge of a deal for Pitt because like you said, I think if you just, you don't even have to read between the lines, just listen to what Pat Narduzzi was saying, it, yeah. <laughs> saying in the offseason. It's like, they're going to get back to more being, you know, complimentary ground and pound. We got to run, establish the run and blah, 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 which if it works, it works. It works a lot more in college than it will in the NFL level. So it's really not that big of a deal, but I think that Slovis is a good fit for what they want to do. I don't think you should expect Slovis to come in and drop back and throw nearly as often as they had Kenny Pickett doing last year. So the pit offense is going to look a lot different. But I think that with Slovis, there is a good floor for what you can do as far as being balanced in the passing and the run game. Um, we have right now some, some big-time opportunities for you to be able to get – private zoom calls with us every single august uh and before the season well uh, cbs sports has a has a great fantasy football today marathon linked up with the saint june's saint jude's children's research hospital and in that there are going to be opportunities for you to be able to bid on things so if you go to the cover three podcast twitter page right now you will find links on ways that you can bid on the in the auction to get private zoom calls with us Last year we did this, and it was a lot of fun, of course, raising money for a great cause, but also just getting a chance to chat with listeners. This is a mailbag episode, and when I got on my call, it was like right off the jump, the the person who I was speaking to was like, oh, yeah, hi, I'm blank, and, and just gave his username, and I was like, oh, we get mailbag questions from you and use them on the show. These are really good mailbag questions, and it got off got us off and running. So again, go to the cover three podcast. The uh, auctions will shut down on Monday. So make sure that you go and do that and you can jump in on getting the opportunity to have a private zoom call with one of us. Again, check it out over on the cover three podcast, Twitter page. Did you have something? Uh, I, speaking of Twitter, there was a tweet yesterday. I don't know if you saw it. It was from, oh, whose name? I cannot remember. Let me find out real quick. It was from McLean Baxley, at McLean Baxley. And it was a photo of Ryan Gosling and Steve Carell walking somewhere. Ah. And the caption, and like Steve Carell is dressed like, you know, he's he's wearing like a baggy polo, baggy jeans, and some like, you know, white, like, dad shoes. And Ryan Gosling's wearing, you know, like a fitted button-up fitted jeans and some boots and just looking like you expect Ryan Gosling to look. And the caption was sports writers above 35 years old versus sports writers under 35 years old. And to be clear, the sports writers above 35 years old, dead on. <laughs> like when you're in a press box and it's just the older dudes in there, that's exactly, that is a hundred percent what just about every single one of them looks like, unless you're at like a special event. Like if you're at the title game, people dress up, but from, if you're just at a normal game, people are just kind of, you know, dressed as, dress casual but i just want to be clear chip how many sports writers under the age of 35 have you ever seen in a press box that look like ryan gosling hey hey now listen we've we've got a couple you know even on our cbs staff that are sharp dressed and good looking sean i'm looking at you you're always uh bringing that a game and that top look and 
there is uh, there's certainly some uh, some sports writers who are who are gonna take big swings with their style. Like I I took some big swings with my style at a at a at a younger age, but you know this. The, the time for peacock. Nobody in the press box looks like that. For if you're watching on YouTube, we're showing the photo right now. Nobody looks like that. I'm sorry. Nobody. Hell, no sports writer under 35 can afford to dress like that. I mean, yes. for the most part, 100 fair. <laughs> but also, it, it, uh, it is cute to me. Like I, I will give Shahan credit. Shahan does have some drip in his game. He tweeted some photos. You can check it out. But I, I, I find it adorable how many sports writers under 35 think they look like Ryan Gosling when they put on their nice clothes and go to the press <laughs> box. But folks, I've seen you in those press boxes and you Tom's don't. Out here saying you look ugly <laughs> i'm not saying you look ugly i'm just saying you don't look as good as you think you do but i think it's great that you think you look that good because confidence is key. yeah there you go the the confidence doesn't the confidence doesn't really get broken until you're at least you know 10 years in the game and then you're like okay we just we just got to hang on as long as we can and steve carell in that untucked oversized polo shirt with the no, jeans that is dead on. Dead shoes. <laughs> just hanging on it is a hundred percent just hanging on right there i this listen uh 35 year old right on the nose the push of this mm -hmm. right here checking in i bounce between these two catch catch me in like well, a full um weekend right and I'm, i might have both of these outfits on at different times depending on whether it's the the 8 a.m press conference or whether it's like the actual game later in the night so i've i think that i can i can dance in both worlds i think i think there's two things that might be happening here though with the tweet i think that he is confusing under 35 sports writers with under 35 talking heads on television because tv money is much different than i'm a 30 year old beat writer for local you know school or local paper at the school money so maybe that's the confusion but yeah no there there are very few ryan goslings in a press box at any college football stadium anywhere well, yeah then, then you're probably not uh you're probably not a sports writer right no. yeah <laughs> if or or you don't have to be a sports writer sports writing is just something you're doing <laughs> under 35 looking like he's about to watch the nfl at his house yeah <laughs> exactly uh coming up on the other side we take a dip into the big old bag of mail starting with a look at LSU, where we remove them from the SEC, where would they stack up in other conferences? That and more next. Be specific. She seemed the same as you remember, or different. Something's going on with Esther. It's more than that, Mother. That's exactly what I'm afraid of. Esther's behavior has been so erratic. Who are you? My name is Esther. Orphan First Kill, rated R, now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We're going to go ahead and take a, a live one from the chat right now. Kez asks, is Deuce Vaughn a top five running back in the country? And if not, where would you slot him? I think this is a very fun and pertinent question because... We just released our CBS Sports All America team uh, in the last couple weeks, and Deuce Vaughn was not a first team selection. Um, you know those first team selections. It was uh, it was Bijan Robinson and who's the other one? Uh, Travion Henderson. Travion Henderson from Ohio State. So Deuce Vaughn top five. What do you think? Uh, I mean. If he's not in your top five, I can't imagine he's far outside of it. I think that it's always going to come down to personal tastes. He would be in my top five, but I'm trying to think of off the top of my head. I mean, Bijan's in there. Trevion's in there. Zach Evan is in there. I'm Already? Probably... Zach Evans? Yeah. Talent-wise, yeah. Okay. I mean, he doesn't have the production yet, but when he's been on the field, like when he was at TCU, like it's he's small. Yeah, I'm. I I'm, I will give a penalty to small sample size from time That's to time. Fine. I think like Deuce Vaughn hit the field, and immediately we were like, "That guy's different." That's yeah, no, Deuce, Deuce Vaughn's in my top five. I'm just trying to think of other guys that you would consider. So, right. um, Braylon Allen, I probably have in my top five, just because I think that you know he was only 17 last year. He's 18 like, now. Is that? I, I heard that. Yeah, no. Um, I I like Chris Rodriguez a lot. Chris Rodriguez is not an exciting running back, 
but I think is just as far as getting the job done and being not just, he's not a Jag plus he's more than a Jag plus of the running back position, but he's not, you know, the game breaker guy who's going to be an early NFL draft pick. I think he's a guy who's going to go on to have a solid NFL career though. Uh, I think Blake Corm at Michigan's pretty good. Mm. Devin a chain, Jameer Gibbs, Sean Tucker at Syracuse is a guy that never really gets discussed because he plays for Syracuse. I love Chase Brown at Illinois, but no, Deuce Vaughn, I think is def he's in my top five, but I, if he's not, I, I won't be surprised if he's not in everybody's top five. And I don't think it's egregious if he isn't because there are some size concerns. Personally, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care because of what he's able to do at that size in terms of um, run after the catch, what he's able to do in the open field. Mm -hmm. This might be a little controversial. I'll put him ahead of Devin A. Chain. And that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably end up with him somewhere in the top five. Sean Tucker's a great call right there. I was going to mention him if uh if he did not already get mentioned. But the that running back tier, it's I mean, it's it's not the glory days of the running back. And Blake Corum, for example, also has a deep running back room, which he splits carries with. And you know who's probably happy about that? Blake Corum. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> when uh they started to get injuries and everything was on him, he got a lot of yards, but Obviously, it's a, a lot more hits as well. And the thing, too, with Vaughn is he's a running back because that's the position he's listed at. But I don't – he's one of those running backs I don't consider just a running back. I, I view him more as a weapon that can play running back, who can probably line up in the slot, who can help. He's like he's an all-purpose player. He's listed at a running back on the roster, so we consider him a running back. But I think he can do a lot more than just be a running back. Which is also where Jameer Gibbs is probably going to fit yeah. into the equation mm -hmm. with Alabama. All right, let's go into the big old bag of mail. A reminder, if you leave us a five-star review and in that review, put your mailbag question. Uh, we will tackle it in a future mailbag episode. I hate contributing to all the SEC greater than all madness, but, but last week while listening to the SEC West win totals, I got to thinking about LSU, which by the way, I went to Tiger Stadium last year. Based on this show's recommendation from a previous mailbag, and it did not disappoint. So listen, we're we're telling you, Tiger Stadium is it is a it is absolutely on your stadium bucket list. Um, I'm glad our boy uh, T Stars was able to do it. Uh, he asks, we perceive this as a down year for LSU with the new coaching staff and roster questions. With that said, where would the Cover Three crew rank LSU in the remaining Power Five conferences going into the season? My data model projects them at second in three at second. Wow in three of the four and third in the other conference. I want to see if there's any consensus or strong disagreement with my projections signed one of your 25 Vermonters that never miss an episode of this multi-platform excellence as always our love to the great state of Vermont and your passion for the cover three podcast. Uh, this is not, a simple question to answer because as i said during that sec west win total episode that inspired the question i don't really know what to expect of lsu this year it could go in a lot of different ways it is a very volatile stock i will say that from a power rating standpoint the ratings will vary but i'm guessing that lsu is probably not going to be much higher than 25 in anybody's or lower than 40 in anybody so you put them in that kind of window like I would not have them. I'm trying to think of what conference I would have them being the second best team in. And I don't, no. I just don't know. I mean, in some group of five conferences, sure. But I don't see another power five conference where they're the second best. If you look at the ACC, I'd have them behind Clemson. I'd have them behind Miami. I might have them behind NC State. If you go to the Big Ten. I've got them behind Ohio State. I've got them behind Michigan. I've got them behind, I uh, probably equal ish to like Penn State, Michigan State in that kind of tier. Oh, I've got a conference they could be second. The Big 12? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Where, but, like, depending on what you think of Texas, which, of course, you know, comes with all of its own intrigue, what you think of Baylor. Baylor power ratings don't really love Baylor, or at least some no. of the ones that I've been scanning right now don't really love Baylor right now. But I, I think that in the Big 12, LSU could make an argument, at least, as the second-best team. In the Pac-12, LSU could make an argument as the third-best team. ACC, I've got them third at best. Big Ten, I might have them fourth. Yeah, no, it, it's again, it's uh, especially this early in the season, power ratings aren't exactly accurate yet. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think LSU is that good this year. 
I think there's way too many question marks. Okay, so now now I get to um, dance on the other side of this because I just I think I just had to fire up an LSU underrated. By the way, how's how's the mentions been doing as we've been having to detail overrated and underrated teams for all the Power Five conferences in our CBS Sports previews? You know, there's a filter on Twitter now where it lets you block out any mentions of people who haven't like confirmed their account. It really erases a lot of that stuff. Oh, interesting. Like if they don't have a confirmed email address, you're not going to see their mentions in your column. And you'd be amazed how many kind of just angry morons that eliminates from the conversation. So I was, I did an LSU underrated. And my, my premise is that um, if your defensive line is really, really good. And our expectation that if, especially if they're able to stay healthy, that like the LSU defensive line, top line should be really, really good. I think the wide receiver room is a wide receiver room that most, not all, but most other SEC teams yes. even would trade their wide receiver room to have LSU's wide receiver room. And that in the modern college football game, if you've got a really good defensive line and if you've got really good wide receivers, you're a game-changing quarterback away from being able to have all of the necessary pieces to win in this, you know, uh, win in open field, you know, passing type, uh, pace and space, whatever name you want to call the modern game. But defensive line, wide receiver, quarterback, these are all like huge key ingredients. I throw in that it's we've got Brian Kelly who has his own like, you know, super successful track record, one of the most talented rosters he's had. I I think that for the um, the, for the general public, and by general public, I'm unfortunately just using the SEC media poll. SEC media poll had LSU fifth. I don't think LSU is the fifth best team in the West. I think that LSU might be the fifth best team in the entire SEC. And that's sort of a, that that's where I base my under LSU is being underrated because if they can figure out the quarterback position, they have the most talented roster Brian Kelly's had. And real difference makers at the necessary places on the depth chart to be able to win. See, I think, like I said, that's volatile. I think LSU can finish last in the West this year. Honestly, I don't think it will, but I think that I think it's got it in the bag. And I think that, you know, it's just because again, they, they can finish second. They can finish last. I really don't know what to expect, but I think Jordan brings up a pretty good point. Um, he says this breaks down to instability at QB. USC has so much bu buzz because of Caleb Williams being there. If Williams went to LSU, the Tigers would get infinitely more hype because the rosters are similar. And that's true. Although I will say the one difference is LSU's got to play in the SEC West, whereas USC is in a Pac-12 South that I think is a slight bit softer. Yeah. The and, SEC West this year. And, and while there's talent, the, the losses to the transfer portal are going to cause alarm. We are used to LSU being DBU, and they are um, a little bit weaker than we are used to on the back end of that defense. You know, we're really only talking about the defensive line as being the the real strength there. A couple injuries at the wrong places, then all of a sudden, yeah, we do start to see a little bit of a drop off. But I've th back to the answering the question. I think that we are we both sound like I'm not going to put them second in three of the other power five conferences and third in the other, but you take them out of the sec West and we are talking about top three, maybe top four team uh, overall in any of those other conferences. Casey in the chat says, Tom, you will talk to you about how wide receivers matter more than everything, but ignore the fact that LSU has a top five group in the country. Crazy logic. They do have a top five crazy group in the country, but talk to me about everything else. And while okay. wide receivers might matter more than everything else, if everything else is very much in question, it's hard to know what the hell to expect from a football team. Like if you don't know exactly who's going to be throwing them the football and how effectively they're going to be getting the football to those wide receivers, that matters. If you don't know how good the defense is going to be, that matters. If you have questions about the offensive line, that matters. If Jaden Daniels is the starting quarterback, is that a bad sign? <sighs> I mean, Jaden Daniels, I feel like maybe – I feel like sometimes I'm a little too harsh on him because I had such high expectations for him when he first showed up and he never lived up to him. So I wonder if I'm viewing him from that lens of saying, just seeing what he hasn't been instead of what he is. But because mm, I, I think, think Nussmeyer could be like, and again, I did not scout Nussmeyer. This is more the like buzz that has been coming even before Miles Brennan decided to step away from football. You know, the idea that you just kept you like, no, I don't know, Nussmeier's still in the mix. Nussmeier's still in the mix. Obviously, there was something that he was showing. There was something that he's been doing behind the scenes that leads to him continuing to get that kind of buzz. 
I like you in being a little bit unfair, but I am also concerned that we're going with the reverse Bo Nix theory where mm -hmm. we look at Bo Nix and we're like, you get out of the SEC, you go to the Pac-12, now all of a sudden your versatility, your playmaking ability, your dual threat, like all of that is going to be a little bit easier because you are not playing SEC defenses in terms mm -hmm. of you know speed, strength, all those things. Jane Daniels is the opposite, mm -hmm. where he has versatility, playmaking ability, dual threat ability, but he's going from the Pac-12 and he's going to the SEC, specifically the SEC West. And so I'm that's where my concern is with Jane Daniels, which again, I'll admit I probably have some bias here because we didn't see expectations fulfilled after a, a, a big wow moment during his freshman season. But he's also stepping into a more difficult world in terms of uh, his playmaking ability. But you know what Jaden Daniels had his first few years at Arizona State when he was playing well? NFL receivers. Do you know what he's got at LSU? NFL receivers? NFL receivers. About four. So, That's true. Maybe. Hey, here we go. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's keep it moving. This is preseason. Here we go. Question from Yort. Great pod. I love every episode and can't wait for the 2022 season to get underway. At the time of posting this, the official preseason rankings have not come out yet. Well, they have now. Uh, based on the way the committee ranks teams and how they show little love to group of five teams, I mean, they kept San Diego State ranked after they lost to Utah State in the Mountain West Championship game and snubbed Utah State from the rankings after they pulled off a blowout upset. Do you agree that the college football playoff rankings should start in the preseason and continue all year long? I have one pro and one con for this pro. We get continuity the whole season and things stay consistent in the rankings con the committee likes to keep things under wraps. And so only having to rank teams for five weeks makes it a little less obvious who will make the playoffs in a year when most power five champs are one loss. And there are a lot of teams in the power five that are good, but have one loss. Also, most of the five to eight deserving group of five teams would be snubbed and you would have the two best teams from the American and in the Sun Belt in the whole season and no one from the other three group of five conferences, even if they had a ton, even if they had a massive non-conference stretch again, would be able to get in. Let's see, in the year, to be fair, oh my gosh. Again, love the UNITY and keep going on. Keep up the good work and keep, Go keep flying to lock infinity and beyond go bucks and go BYU. He also had a mention in there about uh, BYU's treatment where they ended up number 13 in the final rankings. I, the premise I like because it brings up the discussion that I think has two, two sides of which he started to scratch the surface on both, but just as a matter of preference, do you think the college football playoff selection committee should release preseason rankings and or rankings throughout the entire season? Hell no. Hell no. Okay. No, God, no. That is the last thing we need. Because first of all, preseason rankings just kind of set the narrative for the entire season. Like if a team starts the year in the top 10 in the AP poll, everybody thinks they're good. So even when they start off 0-2, they still get the benefit of the doubt because, well, they were eighth before, the, before we ever saw them play. So when we're not stupid, we would never be wrong about a team. So clearly they're still pretty good. So we'll just put them 20th. And then as soon as they win a game, we bump them up again, five spots. They're one and two, number 15. God, no, I I think, I don't think the playoff committee should release rankings until the very end, but that's never going to happen because, you know, TV content. Cause that's all those rankings folks. That's, that's all the show is. It's just a television show on ESPN. And then it becomes content for us to talk about and write about and blah, blah, blah. They don't mean anything. They tell you they start from scratch every single week. So why the hell does any of it matter? Doesn't. No, we do not need preseason rankings because it is pointless. And they will do. To, and they say they say I, I want to see their biases. I, I want to see because that's the thing is some of these teams that get rankings. Are the <laughs> same as anybody else's. I'm the saying the SEC is going to have ten teams in there, and then there's going to be a couple Big Ten teams. There's going to be the token Group of Five team. There'll be Clemson, the second best ACC team, and whoever they think will win the Pac-12. Those will be your top twenty-five. There you go. Boom, I, bang. I want to see specifically who is the team that they are overrating in the preseason that they are using and counting as a quality win. I want to find that um I, I want to find that SEC team or that Big 10 team that they are overvaluing when that team ends up losing and they end up boosting the other team later in the season. Like who like who is how about this 
Texas. I, I want to see the college football playoff selection committee trot out a Texas at number 19 or Texas at number 15, the way the coaches poll did with a first place vote. And then you know what? maybe go back into hiding. Give me a preseason top 25 and then you don't get to change it. We just get to see that all season long until you come back in November. And then we get to look at it and, and judge you accordingly. The problem with that is if we were to take them at their word in that they start from scratch every week, the quality win in week zero or week one might no longer be a quality win in week four if that team gets off to a poor start. So why does it matter if that team is a quality win in week two when those rankings aren't going to matter for another three months? That's what I would ask you. So defend it. Go now. <laughs> I'm only at saying for entertainment purposes. Yeah, you're in it for the vibes. Yeah, I'm in it for the laughs. Yeah. I think it would be hilarious to see that selection, who that selection committee has flipped through. That that selection committee picks up uh, a Phil Steele, an Athlon, and a Lindy's and does a like composite average. And that's what the rankings will be. Let's be honest. It'll just be them looking at preseason mags, seeing what everybody else is saying, and then doing the same conclusion that we have because they have no numbers to go off of. In fact, if I'm going to make a change to the college football playoff rankings, and I'll, I'll give, okay, we'll do it, what, five weeks it is that they do it every year before the real ones come out. What's the lowest ranked you can be to get into a New Year's Six Bowl? Like it's 12? It's 12th or 16, depending on the like conference. Cause there's, if, if you've got two teams in the playoff, then you can reach mm -hmm. a little bit further, that kind of thing. All right. Well then whatever it is, 12, 15, 16, that's how many teams should be in the rankings. You don't need 25. Mm -hmm. Like when we, when you're sitting down on that Tuesday night to watch the college football playoff rankings release show, and they show you 25 to 20, who the hell cares? Those teams aren't mad. They don't matter. They're not playing in any of the New Year's Six Bulls. They're just there for them to say, look at us. We know these teams exist. We, no, have, no, no, no plan. No. we have no plans to give them anything, but we know they exist. We They put them there to be quality wins for the teams that are fighting for spots at the top. Remember, there is always room for an 8-4 and four Texas A&M at number 22 in the final college football playoff rankings so that whoever is coming out of the SEC is going to be able to have another quality win. But think of how much easier your process is if there are fewer quality wins to get. You can, you know, like, cause now you're arguing, well, they beat the 23 team and then they beat the 19 team. What the hell is the difference between the number 19 and number 23 team? Yeah. You, always, no. you always end up catching like a Mississippi state down there an Arkansas down there, Kentucky down there, the G five of the week. Yeah. Whoever, whoever yeah. is the G five of the week. Um, yeah. Ultimately, if we want to be productive in the college football playoff selection process, Preseason rankings will not help. Early season rankings will not help. The existing polls do a good enough job of laying out the landscape to a college football fan who is just showing up and just wants to watch college football. And we don't need the selection committee and the pressure of the playoff selection itself to be able to uh, be out there. Will from the chat says, I want a playoff ranking one through 131. Well, you Check know, mine we out. I post it every week. Yeah, I was going to say, we don't get to pick the playoff. No, we should. <laughs> but we have a CBS Sports ranking that ranks the whole daggum F FBS. It's called the CBS Sports 131. It's released every single Monday, and uh, we've got the preseason rankings out now. So uh, keep your eyes out and make that part of your Monday routine because we do rank all 131 teams. Uh, and We can get that going for you. Yeah. And I post my entire ballot, all 131, online. You can look at it anytime you want. Transparency. All right, this next one is right up our alley. Brian asks, my favorite college football podcast, and I have, and I listen to a lot of them, these guys have a great time together. They know their football. Yeah. They have fun doing it, which makes it fun for us. My question is about cold and heat. I always hear about how it's going to make a difference in a football game. Last year, the heat and humidity were supposed to hurt Michigan State against Miami. Nope. Big Ten fans for years have been complaining that Southern schools won't play up north where they where they have where they opine if they have an advantage. I buy none of this on either end. Football players are tough everywhere. 
Can you guys give me any examples of important games in the past where a Northern or Southern team won a game because the temperature bothered the other team so much they did not play to their ability? Note, I am not talking about the wind in Laramie. <laughs> um, it's going to be windy, windy in Laramie. Laramie. Uh, I mean, I think that the weather narrative is very overblown, yes. But pointing out one instance of Michigan State going to Miami and beating Miami when Michigan State might have just been a better football team than Miami last year, I don't really think disproves the theory. I do think that if you look at the Michigan-Ohio State game last year, if it's not cold and windy and snowing, I think Ohio State probably wins that game. Because I think some teams, just the style that they play, right, is not suited to certain it's, situations. Yeah, it's not your... Um... It is not your geographic location. It is the style of play and how you are able to execute what you want to do. And off the top of my head, I am thinking about offense, but based on different conditions yeah. is without a doubt an impact to this. I mean, don't we see in the NFL every single year, there's this quarterback who comes back from his ayahuasca journey, <laughs> lights it up during the regular season. Mm -hmm. It's home field advantage. And then all of a sudden when they've got to play a game and it's so cold that the football is like a rock, that offense just don't click no more. Mm -hmm. I, I I think too, um, like I think it is, when you play in the cold, I don't think it is honestly as difficult for an offense from a warm environment to come play in the cold. Because once you start playing and you're kind of warmed up anyway, the blood's flowing, you don't really feel it anymore. It's like when you're sitting on the sidelines, okay, if you're sitting on the sidelines for a long time, you start to feel it, you start to bother you. But I think, like we said, it's more impactful if you go to a cold weather environment and you are a pass-happy team and maybe you don't have the ability to just kind of hand off and bruise against your opponent, that's when the weather can deal. I think it's a bigger deal for cold weather teams to go to warm weather. I think elevation matters. And elevation, I was about to say that. I think elevation matters more than anything. Yeah, like, you, you go up to Salt Lake City. Because it... You know, literally affects your breathing <laughs> yeah like the play in at the must yeah you know, we, we talk about the home field advantage that utah has and then interestingly enough to bring up utah because elevation also works the other way when you take yourself down closer to sea level and you're dealing with that humidity especially mm -hmm. in those september games what do we always see man like get out the pickle juice get out the bananas like you will get some cramps all over the place the, the September cramp season is going to be here for those games in the humid in the humidity of Florida, of Louisiana, uh, it of South Carolina. Like it is going to be a big part of it. Are you factoring weather into the Utah at Florida game? Yeah. Yes. I think heat and elevation, humidity, things that affect your body are more impactful than the cold, because I think the cold is more mental. I think if you could just overcome the idea that, oh man, it's cold outside. Once you, once you realize, yeah, it doesn't, you know, it's just cold. It's not really impacting me. Maybe I'm a little slower at first, but once I get stretched out and going, I'm perfectly fine. You overcome it mentally. I don't think the cold is a problem. I think it doesn't affect your body the same way that heat, humidity, and elevation do. Also, Michigan State at Miami brings us the opportunity to talk about how Mel Tucker really set the tone with the shorts. Mm-hmm. Like when he said, nah, Looking boys, like, let's go. South Florida, I'm wearing shorts today. I just wish he wore like those old school high school gym coach shorts, like the really so tight spandex ones. Yeah, that were just like, <laughs> I don't know why like every single gym coach wore those when you were growing up, but they did. I guess it just gave them greater flexibility for yelling at you to, you know, put the balls back in the bin when you're done with them. I'm I'm speaking out of turn here, but I, I don't know if we were ready for Tuck's thighs. I think I think that if Mel Tucker had worn those high gym shorts, we might have seen some. He looks like he still gets on the press, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I bet Tuck Styes would have. I bet Tuck Styes would have intimidated me out of being even be, being able to work. You know, it was a, it was a, an exciting week two, and is I, I might have been so shook I couldn't have come back from it. Maybe we need to get you on the Peloton chips so that way you can feel a little more secure about your own thighs and quads cuz I got to say mine are looking pretty good. One one peloton.com that is o n e peloton.com uh try the bike or tread risk free for 30 days. That's a that's a free plug from uh from Peloton right there. Uh let's go. Also a little bit up our alley. Next question comes from Matt 
if the college football playoff does go to 16, people will complain about the one versus 16 and the two versus 15 matchups not being competitive. But what if we take a twist from European soccer and the Champions League? The final ranking show starts by ranking the teams one through 16, but then there is a random draw for matchups. The top eight get a home game and they would be paired with nine through 16. It would not be fair to the top seeds, but they also shouldn't be struggling with the 12 seed either and could add for some th fun thoughts. <sighs> All right. I am going to throw away my distaste for a 16 team playoff and just look at this from a neutral point of view. Yeah, that would be fun, but yeah, no, I, I think that I would want parameters on it. Like I don't think the nine seed should have to play the one seed. And I don't think the one seed should have to play the nine seed because I don't think that's fair to either of them. Like if you're the nine seed, you've had a pretty good season. So to get tossed up against the best team in the country right away, not fair to you. I think you should do it where the one seed can play anybody from 12 to 16. Oh, those would be seeds. the pots. Yeah. Right so like one of four teams that they could end up playing. I Because I still think that you should be rewarded. If you're not getting a buy, you should still be rewarded with a somewhat easier game. So even if you do end up playing the 12 seed, you're probably still going to be favored by two to three touchdowns. So it's not that big of a deal. But I think it will add it would add an element of entertainment to it before the playoff started. I don't know how much it would change in the actual playoff. In the um, increasing paranoia of college football fans who get it from college football coaches and, you know, all throughout the entire sport. The idea of something being rigged is already too built in. Yeah. I, I don't need to find out about the, like, the, I, I don't need to find out about a cold envelope. I don't need to find out about the like heavy lottery ball that bounced the right way. I'm, I don't, I don't think I'm ready for that. I don't think our message boards are ready for that. Like we're already so deep in that world that, you know, let's leave it to just blaming the selection committee for trying to rig matchups rather than us being able to say, well, sorry, one seed, like you get, even if it was the 12, right, you tried to make a more fair system. And if it wasn't the perfect one through 16, somebody would, somebody would call conspiracy on that one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so easy to do that. Just, yeah. Oh, let's move on. <laughs> uh, next question from Kyle. Best college football show out there. Consistently impressed with the depth of knowledge for pretty much every program in college football, regardless of levels. Shout out to Bud's knowledge of South Alabama's defensive line depth. Been listening, to, <laughs> been listening ever since Tom crushed my dreams and correctly saying Texas A&M never had a shot of making the playoff in 2020. My question is regarding the impact of coaching roles in a program. It was recently announced that the offensive staff was shifted so that James Coley is coaching wide receivers, Damian Craig is coaching quarterbacks, and Dickey is with the tight ends. What impact can specific coaches have at that level of position groups? Is there any hope that this could mean we, <laughs> we learn how to throw more than 10 yards? Or is this more of a half measure and we'll still have a leading receiver this year with only 600 yards on the season? All right. This is a Texas A&M specific one. Is Jimbo Fisher still your head coach? Because if he is, he's coaching the quarterback. Doesn't matter. I, I don't care. I don't care whose job title it is. Jimbo's coaching the quarterback, so that situation is not going to change in a vacuum. Yeah, I do think individual coaches at different positions have impacts. I, I do think like there are certain you know guys who have made a career out of like look at Larry Johnson. Larry Johnson is an excellent recruiter, but Larry Johnson is also an excellent defensive line coach. Like you don't see Larry Johnson coaching a bad defensive line. He gets talented players. And then he coaches them to live up to their talent and play well and know their job. So, yes, position coaches can have a huge impact. Not every one of them, because there are some guys who are hired to coach positions that their primary role on the staff is as a recruiter. So maybe, you know, it's depending on what your team considers valuable to your offense, or your defense. You might see somebody get a position where it's like, OK, you're a tight ends coach, but we don't really use our tight ends. And they're, you know, so it's, or they're mostly blockers. So they kind of fall under the purview of the offensive line coach more than anything. So it's, there's no exact answer. It's just some position coaches are more valuable than others. Some guys are better suited to other positions and some guys are just recruiters that are coaching a position. So I think the shifting of staff responsibilities comes down to communication and like order so much of what college football coaches try to put in place 
are you know an order of operations, a, a formula. This is how we do things. And a lot of that is going to be communications, divvying up the responsibilities. To my knowledge, outside of the jump to coordinator, different position coaches do not dictate specific um, you know, contractual values. So when you're just moving around responsibilities, I see number one, either Jimbo Fisher or any other coach that you substitute here is going to is, is looking to change who speaks in what order when we're all in the room together. The other piece of it, like you mentioned with recruiting, maybe there is a relationship that was established on the recruiting trail where now we would like the chief or primary recruiter for that side of the ball to be able to continue that relationship and work with the development of that player or those players at a certain position. When it is a head coach like Jimbo Fisher, who is very much got his hands on the offense, then it is more likely that he is, he's trying to figure out who all the voices are after Jimbo's voice, mm -hmm. or he's uh, fulfilling recruiting promises where, you know, it's like, I, I don't, I don't know this, but it's like, if I tell five-star player, and I'm, I'm James Coley. I'm in the living room. He's like, I'm going I'm to work with your son every day. And if I also said that to another wide receiver and another wide receiver, then guess what? James, now you're the wide receiver's coach because <laughs> we want to be able to maintain those relationships. We want to be able to keep those players on board because while Texas A&M has done a terrific job recruiting, we are still in the transfer portal era and players could choose to leave Texas A&M if they are unhappy or if they feel like some of those recruiting promises have not been fulfilled. You know, Chip, considering you've got South Carolina beating Texas A&M, I think you could have just said, no, I don't think it'll make a difference. Game Cox, <laughs> let's go. You're going to start to, you're going to start to have fear in your eyes when you watch South Carolina try so hard in a narrow loss at Arkansas in week two <laughs> and cover the first half against Georgia or falling behind in the third quarter. And you're going to be like, oh, no, look at that game later in the season. I'm shaking in my cowboy boots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they'll be saying. Uh, anything else before we get out of here? Uh, have you seen the Manti Teo doc on Netflix? Not yet. It's interesting. I don't want to spoil anything, although I don't know if it's a spoiler considering they it it covered it. It happened. You can look it up on Wikipedia. No, it's, there. there is a spoiler. Oh. But it it's comes clear in like the first five minutes of the documentary so it's not really a, uh, a spoiler but uh you know Renaya Tuiasa Sopo the person who was Lene Kakua mm -hmm. is now Naya Tuiasa Sopo and okay. she is in the documentary and it is a very interesting it's it's a good doc it's two parts it is very enlightening I mean we know most of the story that happened but I think it's really interesting to get the different perspectives from the people who were actually involved in it and it's also it's pretty sad too because like i actually get kind of mad because they got the guys from deadspin doing it who were behind the story and you know they're talking about how what spurred them to do the story and look into it was like you know like major outlets like espn and like sports illustrated were writing all these stories about it and they were the coverage of manti and nobody ever really confirmed that this person existed which is pretty basic journalism when you're doing these kind of stories but then while they do that, they also print stuff that says there's, oh, yeah, we, there's an 80 percent chance Manti Teo's in on it, too, which is like it's like, OK, so you're doing you're doing exactly what you're complaining about them not doing. And you're doing the same thing without confirming it and the impact that it had on the lives, because like Manti Teo. I don't think there was anything in the world that was going to happen that would have let Notre Dame beat Alabama in that national title game. But Manti Teo played terribly in that game. Manti Teo, who was a very good player, goes on to the NFL and never really does anything in the NFL of note. And he talks about it in the in the documentary. He doesn't come out and say it, but like when you just read between the lines of what he is saying, like on the football field, he trusted his instincts. And he just, you know, he knew what he was supposed to do, knew what he was supposed to be doing there. And then the Linnea Kakua situation happens and he no longer trusts his instincts. And I think it directly impacted who he was on the field where he was thinking too much about what he's supposed to be doing instead of just doing it. It's it's a really sad story that I think impacted because I, I don't think Teo would have been a Hall of Famer in the NFL, but I do think he would have been much better than his NFL career would have been. And this story, what happened to him definitely did it. And you just see all the different lives it impacted. It's it's a good documentary. If you've got Netflix, I recommend it. He, uh, I was speaking with a former NFL teammate of Teo last month. And he was detailing that it was like 
man, when uh, when he came into the league, like everybody else in the locker room, it, it was not discussed, but everyone, everyone <laughs> knew it. And it sort of created, it made it, it, it impacted the way that he was able to establish relationships with his NFL teammates, uh, especially early on in his and, career. And Teo says in the documentary, like, he's like, you know, it used to be I'd walk into a room and he'd be like, whoa, look, it's Manti Teo. And he says, and then he's like, suddenly I'm walking into a room and it's always, hey, look, that's that guy. Mm. And it completely changed yeah. everything for him. Yeah. Uh, saw a comment from Derek in the chat. Where can I play fantasy college football? Well, I've got one better for you. How about where you can jump in on a college football pick them because college football is almost here and there's no better way to join the action than the CBS Sports College Football Pick 'em. You can run a custom pool with friends and enter our CBS Sports Challenge for a chance to win guaranteed weekly and season long prizes plus the $100,000 jackpot. Get started now at cbssports.com slash win or from the more menu of the CBS Sports app. Once again, that is cbssports.com slash win or on the CBS Sports app, no purchase necessary. See rules for details. We will be back getting you set for week zero. Week zero locks Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Be back here at YouTube.com slash cover three, or of course, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Tom, thank you very much.